Jaya. She's so excited about this. She was like, yeah, Trav, I'm pumped. I'd love to be interviewed. Just wait till I vomit and then I'll be here. Um, <laughs> so, you, so you can use this one here. So I'm going to pass it to you. Now, Jay, um, now I, I forgot to write my questions down on a sheet of paper, so here we go. Doo -doo. Now, who's at home and, and where do they live with you at home? Now, look at that. that one here. Home is uh, now King Creek. Um, I've got husband David, three children, Joshua, Caitlin and Victoria, um, and a dog. And a dog. My baby. Your baby. <laughs> now, um... Where did you grow up? Um, wow. Well, I come from the Philippines. So I uh, was born in the Philippines. Um, lived in a was born and lived in a village for the first four years of my life. Then moved to the city, and then at nine we moved to Australia. And I was just counting last night. Moving to King Creek is our tenth is my tenth move in Australia. It's my tenth home in Australia. So I've lived all around Sydney, and this is the first time I've moved uh, regional. Regional. Now, how long have you been here, up in our part of the world? Oh, oh, in... Camden Haven. Camden yeah, Haven. Yeah. Um, we moved just after Easter last year, so probably... Coming up to a year. Yeah, going up to a year, 11 months. Okay. In 11 months, what do you most love about being in the Camden Haven? Um, I think it would have to be the scenery. Uh, I know my husband will be the first to say that I don't like camping, but I do like trees. <laughs> I like the look of the trees and the lovely country road sort of drives. So, um, yeah. And I think the, the space, um, not just space um, in terms of physical space, but head space. Yeah. It's just different from the city. Yeah, excellent. Now, you've been with us at church for about 11 months. Yep. That's right. Um, have you always been a Christian or how did you become a Christian? What's the story there? Um, just like Rylan was saying, I don't have that, you know, penny drop moment, um, but I can sort of um, look back and see that there are stages in my life that have made those significant impacts um, through my journey with God. So my dad used to work overseas in Saudi Arabia, of all places, where he found and met the Lord. Um, and that's where he became a Christian. So all of a sudden, we're going to church. I remember my mum teaching me how to pray at night before going to bed. Um, my auntie at 15 made a significant impact in teaching me how to do devotions, um, reading the Bible. Um, throughout high school, I had one good Christian friend who kept me, kept me on the straight and narrow. And then um, just after high school, I had a bit of a breakdown and um, left church. The church that we were going to blew up, um, just uh, leadership issues. And I walked away from God and church, you know, after having committed all of my life serving in, in ministry growing up, it, it, it felt like, what, what was all this for? And so um, first year of university, I was spending my Sundays watching Elvis reruns and Eurovision very worthy, worthy time, until um, I realised that I'd had a taste of God and I just knew how good he was and I just, life without him wasn't quite the same. So with the trajectory of my relationship going like this in high school, suddenly I fell off a cliff. Um, but then when I recommitted my life to Christ, it's, it's not been always upwards, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, but I think through that roller coaster ride, he has proven himself faithful even when I haven't been faithful. So, my relationship with Christ has been, um, you know, there wasn't that one moment where I could say I got converted, but he has just been faithful all throughout and he's been with me all throughout yeah. as I've grown in that relationship. Awesome. And what, what do you find today where you're at? What do you find most encouraging? No, there's God's faithfulness, but is there anything else you find really encouraging as a Christian? And what, what do you find particularly hard? Um, encouraging. I love it when I hear stories of people coming to Christ, when I have, you know, conversations with you guys um, and you tell me about how you met the Lord. That just really encourages me because it brings me back to, to God's faithfulness and how at any age, whether you're young or a little bit later on in life, you met Christ and, and, and you get that light bulb moment. That's really encouraging for me. Um, the hardest bit about following Jesus, being a Christian, is living it. <laughs> um, mm, yeah, mm, uh -huh. li living the Christian life, yeah. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day thing. Um, 
you know, it's when you meet Christ, it's not an easy thing. The first thing that you're presented with is, here's your cross. And um, we have to carry our crosses every day. And um, probably one of the hardest crosses for me to bear is myself. <laughs> I'm my biggest enemy, uh, my biggest critic. And, um, and I think because also there's a bit of a background of being a Catholic and the works part of it, it was hard for me to understand that if I do a wrong thing, you know, oh, you know, I'm condemned and, and all this sort of stuff. And I have to struggle with that every day and um, wanting to please God and wanting to please people and just reminding myself that it's by his grace and by his grace alone that I am I'm even in this position. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing. I know that you it was a hard gig, but say so thank you. Um, yeah, we pray for Jay. Yes. Heavenly Father, it is such a good thing to know you as the one who is faithful. And as, as Jay has just shared, Father, even when we are faith, faithless, you are faithful. Father, thank you that that is such a bedrock for us as your children who will struggle and stumble at different times in our lives, in our walk. Father, we give thanks so much uh, for that auntie who encouraged her. Father, we give thanks for that, that one friend um, that just had her back during high school. Father, in your grace, you, you place these people in Jay's life. Father, we thank you uh, that although um, her experience of, of the Christian life at one point was one of just heartbreak and discouragement, you have proved yourself, as you are, faithful and calling and drawing her back to yourself. Father, we just pray for Jay as he continues to journey uh, as a mum and as a wife, as part of our church family. Father, um, dying to self, keep shaping and moulding her more and more into the likeness of your son. Father, remind her and remind each of us too that it is by your grace that we are saved. It's by your grace we are called your children. It's by your grace um, you will bring us home ultimately. So, Father, keep shaping us in this truth, and we give thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Jay. <coughs> and we'll use those either at the start of the session or for this afternoon, Zay. And have what? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say how much I am uh, grateful for the invitation to, to be here and be with you. Um, there's a very good relationship um, between Ridley College and New Haven. We've got several people in the congregation who have been doing studies with Ridley College, including um, uh, Travis. You've done it as well. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so we're you know, really grateful that we can help and support the, the community here you know, any way we can. Uh, I just want to, uh, I, want to, I want to start off with prayer. Let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Lord, bless us now as we seek to understand what is the kingdom of God and what is our place in it. Bless us as we try to do that, Lord, with understanding, with energy and conviction. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, I guess I want to open up with a, uh, a question. And that question is, when you hear the words king or kingdom, uh, what, do you, what do you normally think of when you hear the words king or kingdom? Um, yeah, Betty? Power. Yeah, or power to the king. Yeah. Sovereign. Sovereign. Yeah. Anything else at the back? Foreign. Foreign. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to think of the coronation of King Charles, which uh, I thought was interesting because it was, it was really soaked in um, Christian liturgy, the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, royal wed you know, British royal weddings and coronations are uh, some of the, uh, the, the main ways in which Christian things you know, symbols, traditions, scripture readings are communicated to the rest of the world. And, and that's, that's you, know, you know, I don't know whether you're a monarchist or a republican, that's at least one benefit of the, of the, of the monarchy, the, the, uh, the attention it seems to get on a global stage. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you could think of everything ranging from Elvis, you know, the, uh, the king of rock and roll. Uh, I think of uh, the return of the king. Uh, from Lord of the Rings. I mean, they're the things that come to my mind. But I guess the other thing that comes to maybe everyone's mind eventually is King Jesus. And in fact, in the liturgical calendar, there is a day called Christ the King Sunday. 
But of course, you know, I believe every day is Christ the King day. Uh, let, let, me, let me kick off with a, a Bible reading. This is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, Everyone is aware that the, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, was pretty much central to the message of Jesus, central to his teaching. You know, his parables are little vignettes or, or anecdotes about what the kingdom is like. Um, his ethics is for people who live under the, uh, the kingship of the king. Salvation is to enter the kingdom of God. But where people kind of diversify or maybe get a little bit confused is what is the kingdom of God? And even scholars dispute and debate what this thing is. You know, some people say, well, the kingdom of God is the coming of God as king. It's God's sphere of sovereignty, divine government. The church is a spiritual kingdom, God in strength, God's dynamic reign, the love of God and the brotherhood of man, a military triumph over Rome, pure theocracy. A brokerless society of equals or economic liberation. Now, all of these things might actually have something going for them. I can find, you know, one or two verses in the Gospels that might resonate with some of those ideas. But the the danger is any reader, whether it's the, you know, the nerdy scholar or just a normal person, we can always be maybe a little bit too selective or we read our own ideas uh, into the Gospels as to what the kingdom of God is. And I mean, when it comes to Jesus, when he thinks of the kingdom, is he he thinking of the kingship of God? Is he thinking of a future state like heaven or the new creation? Or is he thinking about divine action? And the truth is, in in, in many ways, the, the kingdom of God can relate to all those sorts of things. But, I mean, we've got to start with the, the Old Testament. I think, I think the Old Testament background is very important to understanding what Jesus meant about the kingdom. And in the Old Testament, we see that, uh, that Yahweh, the, the, the covenant name of Israel's God, Yahweh is king. He's the king of Israel because he's the creator of all things. And also, he's the one who delivered the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. So you, you see, see Yahweh as king in creation, in the Exodus, and then when uh, the Judeans went into captivity, when the Assyrians and the Babylonians kind of invaded and, and took many of them away to foreign lands, uh, they were waiting for a day when God would show himself as king again and return the people from captivity and bring them back into their own land with their own temple, with their own king with their own you know, covenant blessings. So just as God was king in the original Exodus, when you get into some of the later prophets, they're waiting for the day when God is going to show his kingly power once more. Uh, and and there's, there's numerous parts of the Old Testament that, that talk about this. Uh, probably my favorite one is Isaiah 52. This is what the prophet says. Again, this is where you know, the Judeans are in Babylon in captivity and they're hoping for the day they'll be set free and they can return back to their land. And this is what I, I, Isaiah says. He says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The Lord has bared, bared his holy arm. Before the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. 
In that part, Isaiah is saying, yes, you're in exile, but the exile is going to come to an end. God's going to show his, his, his kingly power. This is the good news, the glad tidings that God is going to set his people free. Or we can look at the book of Zechariah, uh, which says, And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Or in Obadiah, I mean, maybe not a book you might have read a lot, uh, Obadiah. Those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Again, it's looking for this day to say, look, we know God is king, but we want to see that kingly power displayed, displayed once and for all in a, in a, in a real definitive way. And, and, and in several places in the book of Daniel, there's this hope that the, that the kingdom of God will be established and it will be a truly everlasting kingdom. So that, that was the, the general idea of what the, of what the kingdom of God is. It's, it's, it's about God is the king of creation, the king of Israel. But just as God showed his kingly power for us in the exodus from Egypt, we, we want to see that again when he brings us out of Babylon or out of Assyria. Now, when the Judeans did come back, to the land of Israel, they were still under the domination of a foreign power, a foreign empire, initially under the Persians. So it was good. The Persians allowed the Judeans to come back. But then the Judeans got taken over by you know, the great conquests of Alexander the Great. And that's when you get the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and the ancient Near East then becoming effectively Greek for a time. And then the Greek empire kind of fragmented a bit, and eventually they were replaced by the Romans. So much like in Daniel's vision, it's kind of like, you know, one pagan monster after another is dominating, you know, and, and oppressing and bearing down upon God's people. So even though they had been brought geographically back to the land, all those great promises of, of, a, of a new king, a new temple, and a new covenant, they had not really come to fulfillment yet. They had not come to fruition. So the effects of the exile were still ongoing. And there was still this hope for this new exodus to be fully realized. And it's at this point that Jesus comes along, effectively saying, you know those promises about God becoming king, the full end of exile, a new exodus? Well, good news. The shot clock has wound down to zero. D-Day has arrived Aslan is on the move. That's basically what he's saying. This is all now happening. And Jesus talks about the kingdom, but he also he talks about it in a future sense. It's both future, but it's also going to be present. Okay, This is what we're going to call the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. So let's look, look at the not yet aspect. J Jesus clearly talks about the kingdom as something that's going to be realized in the future. That's why he tells, he tells the disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. We want to see the God's kingdom. It's not here in its all its fullness, but we want it to be. Jesus talks about the necessity of entering the kingdom of God. You can only do that with the openness and vulnerability of a child. If you're going to enter the kingdom, you need a righteousness greater than that of the Pharisees. Without being seduced, by possessions. At the Last Supper, Jesus said he would not drink from the fruit of the vine until he can enjoy it afresh in the kingdom of God. And the king, what will the kingdom of God be like? It will be like a great banquet hall. There will be a renewed Israel. And even, even Gentiles will be joining people in attendance. Uh, the kingdom of God can be equated with eternal life. The renewal of all things. An inversion of social power. So the first will be last and the last will be first. There will be a resurrection. And most importantly, everything sad will become untrue. That's the future element of the kingdom of God. At the same time, Jesus isn't just saying, well, it's coming Soon, eventually, it's kind of impending. No, there is a sense in which Jesus says we know it's coming because the first installment of it is already here. We've got the, the deposit, the down payment, the first firm foot on the ground is, is already there. Um, 
Jesus preached that the kingdom of God was not merely a future hope, it was also a burgeoning reality. The kingly power of God was something they could see, touch, hold, and believe in. That's why he said the kingdom of God has come near. It's here. And people need to change their way of thinking and they've got to believe in this kingdom. And this is the message that Jesus preached as he traveled around Galilee and Judea. Uh, and this is more than, hey, you know, God is king, long live the king. It's, it's, it's kind of like uh, the, the, he's holding the coronation now. God, this, this kingship of God, this salvation is already happening. It, it means something dramatic and unprecedented is unfolding before people's eyes. Uh, th- th- Jesus is then something like what Isaiah is doing in chapter 57, saying, I bring you glad tidings that Israel's God is king. And the proof of that is all the various things he does. Because Isaiah said, well, you know that God is coming king because... You know, the the blind will see, the lame will be healed, the poor will have the good news preached to them. And that's the very thing that Jesus does. That's the very thing he gets up to. I mean, John John the Baptist, you know, was, you know, you know, the one who a voice in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He's doing all that, and Jesus comes onto the scene. John points to him as the one, the one who is to come. But then something happens to John. John criticizes Herod Antipas because he was kind of, you know, he married his sister-in-law while his brother was still alive. And in Jewish law, you're not meant to do that. And John the Baptist kind of criticized him for that. And Herod Antipas did not like that. So he threw him in prison. And when John the Baptist is in prison, knowing he's probably not going to be long for this age, he sends some of his disciples to Jesus saying, um, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Because, you know, I, I, we, some of us think you might be the Messiah. You're bringing the kingdom. But I've got to tell you, uh, Jesus, where I'm sitting in Herod Antipas' dungeon, it doesn't feel very kingdomy <laughs> in this dungeon. So uh, are you the real deal or what? And then Jesus tells the disciples, go tell John this. Go go tell John what you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the poor have the good news of the kingdom preached to them. In effect, he's telling uh, John, okay, don't mistake the reality of the kingdom with its reception. Yes, Antipas may feel very comfortable in his little fortress. Caesar may still be on the throne in Rome. But believe me, The revolution, the reordering of power, the kingship of God is unfolding before their very eyes. God's plan to put this world to right is happening. It has actually begun. Uh, And and, and that's what's going on. Now, central to this this nowness, if you like, I mean, there's several things in this now. One of it is the, the defeat of Satan. Okay, the, the tempter, the, the enemy of God's people. Uh, and, and Jesus can say things like in, in, in Luke 10, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. In his own ministry, his preaching, his proclamation, his, his miraculous deeds, you know, what he does for both the rich, the poor, and everyone in between, that is a defeat of the satanic realm. You know, and and it's, in one sense, it's kind of sad. You see, the, the the Pharisees and the scribes they hear about this kind of upstart, untrained preacher from Galilee, and they and they see what he does, and they can't deny that this is pretty miraculous. And they say it's it's by the power of Beelzebul he does all these these things. He's empowered by a satanic force that explains his 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 magical abilities. And when Jesus faces that accusation, uh, he kind of really exposes his logic. Okay, Like everyone accepts that I'm basically plundering the satanic kingdom. Okay? I, am, I am just setting people free from the bondage of evil. Okay? And you're telling me I'm doing that empowered by Satan. Okay? In other words, you're arguing Satan is invading himself. 
Okay, that doesn't mean that no one does that. Who would do that? You know, that doesn't make any sense. It's I, I'm not I'm not driven by saying I am the strong man who has come to set the captives free. That's what I'm doing. And because of what they said, the scribes who look at what Jesus does through the Holy Spirit and they damn it all to hell. And they've done the, 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 the one thing that you can't do and that's basically curse and condemn the work of God. And they commit what even is called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Jesus is uh, the one who is bringing God's kingdom. And you see that in the defeat and the retreat of the satanic realm in the face of the advancing kingdom. Uh, the other thing we, we need to, to mention is how the kingdom is particularly located in the person of Jesus. You know, for a long time, people used to think, well, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. And then the church proclaimed Jesus. So, I mean, you've got kind of what Jesus is doing, which is very different from what the church did. Okay? So, Jesus is all about, you know, God's kingdom, the kingship of God. So, Jesus was just a good monotheist. And then all the apostles, they kind of swapped out the kingdom to become, you know, proverbial Jesus freaks. So, people, there's a big discontinuity, people, some say, between, you know, Jesus' ministry and the ministry of the apostles. Uh, except that that's not what happens. Jesus doesn't merely proclaim the kingdom of God. Okay, uh, Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is coming and I am the one through whom it is coming. Okay, He puts himself, he puts himself at the center of God's kingly actions, God's kingly power. That's why he says in Luke 11, look, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay? He sees himself as the centerpiece, as the, the fulcrum, the hinge point through which the kingdom comes. And one's relationship to God the king, one's entering the kingdom of God, hinges on how you respond to him. Do you treat him like the scribes or, or, or those who mock and deride him? Or do you see him as the one in whom the kingdom of God is coming? When we come to the parables of Jesus, again, we also see something of what the kingdom of God is like. I mean, if you ask you know, maybe people in the first century, you know, how do you bring the kingdom of God? There will be different options. Okay? If, you go, if you go down by the Dead Sea, you know, there, was, there was a community down there. That's where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls from. These are people who thought, well, that the world, even the Jewish world, the Jerusalem, the temple, it's all corrupted, contaminated. They use the wrong calendar. They do the sacrifices the wrong way. They don't know the difference between pure and impure. So we're going to move out to the Dead Sea. We're going to establish our own commu a community. We're going to write a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. We're going to have our own meals. We're going to keep ourselves pure and wait for God to send an angelic army and to wipe them all out. Or something roughly along that. That's one way of bringing in the kingdom of God. Keep yourself pure, holy, and wait for God to bring his wrath and judgment on the wicked and the lawless. Okay? Then there were the Pharisees. Uh, and that, that, they were trying to bring renewal, renewal to the Jewish people. They believed, look, if, if, we, if we could you know, keep the law correctly... You know, if we could apply the Torah to every aspect of life, maybe if we all became like a kingdom of priests, we kept the same level of holiness that all the priests kept, you know, maybe that would bring the kingdom of God. Okay? So, you know, let's, 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 let's gather together in communities, let's have shared meals together, and let's pray, hope, and work for a, a purity of heart and a purity of our hands to bring the kingdom of God that way. And then you get other groups. You get like more zealot-minded Jews. You thought, you know, the way the kingdom of God, Torah in one hand and sword in the other. So pray, pray, pray and stabby, stabby, stab, stab. You know, that's the other way to bring the kingdom of God. A bit of, bit of holy violence. You know, got to get rid of all these Gentiles. Not just Gentiles. If you've got a Jewish friend who's friends with Gentiles, he's not your friend. So that's what you've got to do. We've got to, we, we need a bit of holy violence. You know, we've got to expel all of the foreign contamination from our land. Those were largely the different options. 
for bringing in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said, no, that's not how the kingdom of God... And he he tells various parables as to what the kingdom of God is like. He says, well, it's it's like a man who scattered seed along the ground. You know, some of it was eaten by birds. Some of it was just scorched by the sun. But some of it, you know, fell on good soil and it grew and produced a crop 30, 60 and 100 fold. Or he, he tells, he can say it grows like yeast working itself through dough, through dough. See, all of these parables are extended metaphors that present the kingdom as a reality. It may seem, seem uh, inauspicious, but it's destined to dominate all the way, all, all the things before it. The royal rescue and the great drama has begun. But it all hinges on Jesus. He's, he's the one who is bringing this. And I think this is what really did affect the, some of the language of the church. Now, when you get to someone like the Apostle Paul, we don't always associate him with kingdom language. But even Paul could celebrate or talk about the kingdom of God in his own way. I mean, Paul talks about, you know, um, being um, in, in, in the kingdom of the son of his love. That's a wonderful line of Colossians. Being part of the kingdom of the son of his love. That's the love of the father. Or in Revelation, there's, there's this, there's this uh, constant line where it says, and the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever. So if we had to sum this up so far, we could say this. You know, Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom consists of a cluster of themes. You've got the, the defeat of Satan, the rescue of the oppressed people, recompense against the wicked, return from exile, a new exodus, redemption of prisoners, release of debts, respite for the poor, the reversal of privileges, covenantal righteousness, a radical reordering of power, and the renewal of all things. In its future orientation or state, the kingdom appears to be principally, though maybe not exclusively, something spatial, something you you enter into, uh, obtained, a place of eternal life and resurrection. But the kingdom is also a sphere of sovereignty that invades and interrupts the present moment ahead of, of, of of the final wrapping up of all things. So that the kingdom is both present and future. Something we can experience dynamically in the here and now, but something we still want to enter into in the future. Something that is imminent. It's with us, among us, around us, but it also can be kind of transcendent. You know, otherworldly in a sense. It's both a reign and a realm. And it's very much tied to the story of Israel, Israel's hopes about the end of exile, a new exodus coming to fruition because God's plan was always to reach the world to and through Israel. Okay, Because in the biblical narrative, a transformed Israel would transform the world. That's why you can't just jump from Genesis 3 to Romans 3. Because God's plan and purposes, you know, given to Abraham, telescoped through, through Israel, then, then magnified out through Jesus. It's through the covenant people that God's salvation would always come out. Uh, if that is the case, then how are we to think of the kingdom of God? I mean, if we're, tr- if we're searching for a definition of it, you know, what would we go for? Uh, I mean, th- th- I think there's a number of different ways we could think of and define the kingdom of God. Um, I, I, like, I like what I call the 3D definition. The 3D. You could say the kingdom of God is a mixture of domain, dominion, and deliverance. Okay? So the kingdom is, is, is a domain in the sense it's a future state. The kingdom of God is eternal life. The new creation. You know, the resurrection of the dead. You know, a, a, a world with, with, with life and, and effervescent joy. Okay, uh, uh, although there may not be any surfing in the future because John says there was no sea. Maybe you could go sand surfing. I don't know. I don't know. But the future, that the kingdom of God is a future domain. 
Okay, it's a future domain. But it's also, if you like, a, a, a dominion. Okay, it's the exercise of God's authority and a power that we can feel and experience even in the present. When people come out of darkness into the light, that's experiencing kingdom power. When people are healed, healed, not healed, healed from suffering, from trauma, from pain, from sickness. That's a sense in the, that the redeeming and rescuing power of God is experienced afresh as well. That's, 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 that's part of it. It's also the general de- deliverance of, our, of the people. When we, our sins are forgiven, when we're put in the right with God, that's also part of the kingdom. So we could go for what I call the 3D definition. It's domain, dominion, and deliverance. But I have to say there is, there is even yet a better definition of the kingdom. And this is one that comes from an uh, Anglican, Aussie Anglican scholar called Graham Goldsworthy. I don't know if you heard, heard with him. As much as I like my own 3D definition, I have to say I think Graham's, uh, Graham Goldsworthy's may be a tad more memorable. He says the kingdom of God is God's reign over God's people in God's place. Okay? So if you don't like the 3D one, go for, go for the Graham Goldsworthy. Because I, I think that's right. Because you know the kingdom of God is God as king. It's God's reign, his rule over things. But a, but a king has to have a kingdom. And the kingdom need to have a people. So God reigns over his people, and the people have got to live somewhere. <laughs> They've got to have a place. They've got to have a promised land. They've got to have a new creation. So you could say it's got all those same things. God's reign over God's people in God's place. And if I wanted to add my own little thing to that, I would talk about God's rescue for them. Okay. So in terms of what the kingdom of God is, okay, we've seen that look, a lot of people have a lot of ideas of what the kingdom of God is. You know, is it... You know, just some sort of, you know, heavenly blessing, God is king, the love of God, the brotherhood of man. There's a lot of definitions of the kingdom of God, but we've got to understand it in light of the biblical storyline. Okay? That storyline that goes from, you know, Abraham, Moses, the prophets, the, the, the Assyrian um, and Babylonian captivity, the return from exile, and how God's people, how Israel were under the plight and power of one foreign empire after another. You know, the the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. And that's the setting in which this great rescue plan uh, was launched. It's not me clapping for myself, that was Mosquito. Just to be like, yeah, yeah, for me, yeah, for me. Um, uh, So we've we've seen seen that, okay, this is, you have to understand the kingdom of God in light of the storyline of scripture. We've also seen how the kingdom of God is both not yet, it's, it's future. That's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your kingdom come. We want more of that kingdom. But the kingdom is also present by virtue of the ministry of Jesus, the power of, of the Spirit, and the fact that Jesus is our King. And if we want to define that, you, know, we, you could do, go for the 3D definition, domain, uh, deliverance, and oh, what did I say? Yeah, uh, domain, deliverance. A deliverance. Yes, yes, that's right. Even, even I don't remember what I said anymore. It's uh, domain, dominion, deliverance. Um, and then, uh, oh, there's the Graham Goldsworthy definition. Um, God's reign over God's people in God's place. And his, rescue. Hmm? and his rescue, if you want to add a little bit of an addendum on that. But, but here's, here's the thing, and this is what I want to focus on next. You might be saying, okay, Mike, I understand. Okay, kingdom of God... Part of the biblical storyline. Kingdom of God, now and not yet. You know, God's reign over God's people, over God's place. But, but how is that going to affect, you know, the way I eat my Wheaties tomorrow morning? You know, what's that got to do with the way I tether myself to my surfboard? You know, how has that got to do with, with you, know, um, you know, with my relationships with my neighbour? Ha- ha- how I vote? You know, what's that got to do with anything that I live, live my life? Is this kingdom, should this be filed in that little compartment of my life I call religious stuff over here that's kind of separated and insulated from everything else in my life over there? 
How does understanding what the kingdom of God make a difference in my life? Okay, How am I to live as a faithful citizen of the kingdom of God? How do we, you know, individually or corporately as a church, how do you practice and promote the kingdom of God? Uh, that's the things we're going to focus on uh, in the next series of talks. I think next, uh, I'm going to come back and talk more about Jesus as King, and then we're going to talk about more how this all applies, uh, particularly on Sunday, how this applies to living the Christian life as a servant of the King. So th that's where we're going. That's where we're going next. Thank you very much.